Families began moving into Appalachia even before the French and Indian War. A lot of people came here uh, to start a new life, sometimes because they were poor, uh, sometimes because they were on the run from debtors. Life here in Appalachia was very hard, especially early on when you were first starting out. Generally, whole families would come, although sometimes young, very young children would be left back east or up north with relatives until the family could be established. The first need when a family came into Appalachia, whether it was in the 18th or the 19th century, was some place to get in out of the rain. Generally, they found a place to settle. This would be a place with good timber, some place also flat enough where they could farm, and there would have to be a water source nearby, a spring, a creek, uh, maybe even digging a good well. All these things were very important to make sure that they were handy. These are the basic tools of building a cabin. In the 18th and 19th century, iron was fairly expensive, and so a family would have a few tools, mostly just the most important ones to their survival. We start with the felling axe. This would be the axe that would cut down the tree. Some of them had two blades, some of them just had a single blade. If you had a two-bladed axe, you didn't have to stop but half as often in order to sharpen your axe. After the tree was cut down, you would use the broad axe to remove the bark and to begin squaring it up. If you'll notice, the broad axe is flat on one side and beveled only on one side. And this would help ensure a square cut on this side of the axe. The handle is also bent so that when you're working on squaring up a log, your hands are off to one side and out of the way. If you were lucky enough, you may also own an adze and this would help finish squaring the logs up, especially from the top. The broad axe was easy to square up the sides. This would help you finish squaring up top edges uh, and places that the broad axe couldn't reach. And you would do this by working it towards your feet, holding the handle with both hands and bending over and working towards your feet with it. Once your cabin was complete, you would need a roof for it. In order to have a roof, you'd need shingles. And to make shingles, you'd need this tool here called a fro. You would take a slab of wood, put the cutting edge of the fro against the slab of wood, and hammer it through in order to cut a wood shingle. And this would be the shingle for the roof. In selecting a location for your cabin, as well as having good timber and water, you needed good farming areas. You would pick a cash crop that you would grow a good amount of, whether that was corn or flax or anything that could be taken to market and sold. You would also need an area close to the house to make what was referred to as a truck patch. This would be your smaller garden that would feed your family that we still have today. You would have a small amount of various types of vegetables that would be grown in that, whether that would be corn, tomato, beans, or squash, or any other number of vegetables that your family would like to consume. As you plow and till the earth, you'll find stones and rocks, things that may go into cabin construction for the fireplace or the foundation. Um, it may not go into the construction of your first home, but it may go into improvements or construction of your second home. Because after you get your first home built, you may want to add on wings or rooms or even a second story to it. Once you found the area that you wanted to settle in, 
you would claim it by what was referred to as tomahawk right. You would take your tomahawk or a small axe and you would go around and put a small notch in trees to mark the area that you were living within. And as long as you maintained this area and improved upon it by planting and building a home, then this land was considered yours, especially in the 18th century when settlers were first moving here before this land was unclaimed. After you cut your logs with the felling axe and squared them with the broad axe, you would also use your axe to cut notches in the end so that the logs would fit together. You would lay one log on top of the next, and when you were done, you would chink it. The chinking can be a mixture of different materials, some was mud, some was clay, some had horse hair, some had straw, whatever you could mix together to form a type of mortar to put between the logs to stop the wind from blowing through. You would definitely want to add a porch because a porch helps double your working space. You can come out onto the porch with your household work. The ladies could work out here with their sewing or their spinning cooking could often be done outside just off of the porch as well when it was too hot to cook inside. The other thing besides walls and a roof and a porch that a home needs is a door and perhaps windows. The door would be made by splitting a log into boards. There would be boards across on the back side to help hold it together. A lot of cabins tended to have wooden hinges. Some even just had leather hinges. This cabin has iron hinges, so that indicates that there was a blacksmith nearby this home who could make the iron hinges and door fittings for them. Glass was very expensive. Most cabins that had windows did not have glass in them. And if they did, it did not occur until much later and there was time to improve upon the cabin. Generally, windows were just holes cut in a wall with shutters on the inside that could be closed. The more windows you had that were not sealed by more than just shutters would let heat leak out into the wintertime. So it was oftentimes that cabins didn't have any windows, not only to retain heat, but also to keep the home safe from Indian attack. The other item necessary to survival that you would find on a house in Appalachia is a fireplace and a chimney. Remember, when you're looking for a location to build your cabin, you need to find some place that'll also have good farmland. The first fireplace and chimney that you would have on a cabin would be rocks that you would plow up out of your field. The first fireplace would be small, and the chimney may or may not be stone. It may even be sticks stacked in the same manner as the log cabin and covered over with mud. As time allowed, once you got this one completed, you could build onto it later, you could enlarge it, you could make a stone chimney later. Um, there are lots of different options once you get your cabin finished. A lot of people in Appalachia would whitewash the inside of their homes in order to help reflect light, and some would even obtain plaster and plaster the walls inside of their home and paint them white. Now that we've discussed how the home was built and the features that you would have noticed from the outside, let's take a look at what we've got inside. Inside you're going to need sleeping areas, storage areas, you're going to need home furnishings and all the things that go along with that. Today if we had to sit down and make a list of all the things inside of our home, it would take us quite a while to do it if we actually could indeed do it and remember everything. But at this time, families who came west didn't bring very much furniture or furnishings at all with them. The things that they brought needed to be lightweight and they needed to be durable. To light 
the inside of the home. Candles were often used. The candles, we might think, are some sort of wax, but in reality, the beeswax that was available at the time was too expensive to just make candles out of to burn. Most of your candles were made from animal fat. If you did not feel like turning animal fat into candles, you could pour it straight into a lamp and put a wick in it and just use an oil lamp. The candle holder that you see in my hand is made of tin plated iron, just referred to as tin or tin plate. Tin plated items were very popular because the iron made them durable, the tin coating helped them not to rust, they were very lightweight to pack when you came across the mountains, and if you should drop one, then it would only dent or bend, and you could pop a dent back out, you could bend it back to shape. If it were made out of a heavier metal such as cast iron, the cast iron would crack if it were dropped. For this reason, a lot of cooking pots were also made out of sheet brass, sheet copper, and tin plated sheet iron. The furnishings that you would bring with you would be the furnishings that would be the hardest to make on the frontier. If you lived north in the colony of Pennsylvania or east in the Tidewater area of Virginia, you might leave your table at home but bring your chairs because chairs are harder to construct than a table and they're also lightweight and don't take up much room. Women oftentimes would bring the wheel from their spinning wheel leaving the other parts back east or up north and then they would construct the rest when they got here because the wheel would be a hard thing to make on the frontier without specialized tools whereas the rest could be made with just an axe. Items like beds could be made once you arrived here. The typical bed was referred to as a rope bed. It's just a wooden frame with a network of ropes that crisscross around it. Today, on our beds, we have a bed frame, a box spring, and a mattress. There were no bed springs in the 18th and 19th century, so when settlers moved here, they would construct a bed with a network of ropes, and the ropes would act as the box spring. After a little while, the ropes would start to sag, and that would make sleep more difficult because it would sag your back and would not be comfortable. So every so often you would have to retighten the ropes, which is where we get the term sleep tight. There was a popular striped cloth during the 18th and 19th centuries referred to as ticking. And this is what was used to make mattresses, which were then called ticks after the cloth. If you were lucky, a tick might be filled with goose down, but generally they were emptied and became nothing more than sacks for when you cross the mountains to settle in Appalachia. If you were lucky, your tick would be filled with goose down and referred to as a feather tick. But most people who lived in Appalachia, they had what was referred to as a straw tick, and this would be filled with straw, hay, leaves, even corn husks. This area would be a perfect breeding ground for bugs like bed bugs, lice, fleas, ticks. And that's where we get the other part of the expression, don't let the bed bugs bite. The cabin that we're standing in is roughly 10 by 16. And while that sounds small, this was average for most first homes in Appalachia. Remember, Settlers didn't have a lot of belongings that they would need to keep inside their home. They didn't need a large home for storage. They also didn't have electronics. So sitting inside watching the television or listening to the radio was a foreign concept. Most people would work outside the home and would only be inside the home to eat or to sleep. So homes didn't have to be large. One of the common sleeping areas or storage areas that would be built inside of a home would be a loft. This would not be a full upstairs. Rather, it would just be boards split from logs and laid across rafters. And these could extend as far across the top of the cabin 
as the builder thought was necessary to accommodate sleeping accommodations or tool storage. You would access this by a ladder that may or may not be fixed to the loft. It could be removable so you could take it outside and use it outside as well. You would not see stairs in homes for quite a while. Now that you've had a place to get in out of the rain, the second thing that you want to start doing in your home is improving it. Whether that means adding on to the first place that you built, or whether that means building an entirely new place and either turning the first home into an animal pen, or adding it on to the new house by what's called a dog trot, or a roof that would connect the two with no walls around it. The home behind me, you'll see, has some important features. It's got a, a definite upstairs, and it's got a porch. There's some important things that happen with the upstairs we'll look at here in a little bit. The porch is important because it doubles your workspace. Remember, there's no air conditioning here. So in the summer months when it's hot, you don't want to be inside where it's getting stuffy. You can come out onto the porch, and you can do your work there on the porch as well. You can do your spinning on the porch. Uh, you can do some of your cooking outside just off of the porch. It's important still that we have a water source close beside us. There's a creek just off to this side here. And some of the other features that you'll see that have been added onto the house are nice glass windows to let more light in. Not only does the front porch provide extra workspace, but it also helps air condition the house. The shade cast by the porch that falls on the windows helps cool the interior of the first floor. Homes tended to have as, as big a porch or as many porches on either sides as they could manage. The house is still constructed using squared logs with dovetailed ends. We're not going to see frame construction with board outsides and insides for, for much longer still. <clears throat> this home is still going to be stereotypical in Appalachia uh, for quite a while, and in some places, very rural places, even up until about 1900. So now we can go on inside and take a look at some of the interior features. By the 19th century, Lighting in homes was done with refined petroleum products. What we call kerosene now was then referred to as coal oil. Coal oil lamps and lanterns were quite popular. Inside the cabin, now instead of it being just one room or one room with a slight loft, we've actually got an entire upstairs. One of the important things to note is the height of the doors and the height of the ceilings. Now, people tend to think that people who lived 150 or more years ago must have been smaller than we are today, which is only somewhat true. The reason the doors were so short was not because people then were shorter, but because you have a smaller space that you need to heat in the winter. In the winter time, if you had larger ceilings, the heat would rise and it would be warmer where you weren't. And if you open the doors, a larger door would be a larger opening to let heat loose from. Along with, with the new cabin, or adding on wings or rooms, you would also improve the fireplace. It's no longer made of just the stones that you plowed up in the field, but these are actually quarried stones. And if you didn't quarry them yourself, then you would have a neighbor who would be skilled in that, that you could trade with, that could do this work for you. With the improved fireplace, it's much larger in size. You're able to fit more pots and kettles in there. You're able to hang 
pots and kettles above the fire to cook. Whereas before, most of your pots and kettles had to have small feet on them so that when you set them on the hearth, it would keep them up away from the fire. Another improvement that's been added is the bake oven. Once you get hot coals from the fireplace, you can shovel them into the bake oven to bring the inside up to temperature, and then you can put in loaves of bread, pies, or any other thing that you would like to bake. With a completely made second floor, you need a better way than a ladder to access it, which is where we get the staircase. If you'll notice, the stairs are very steep and narrow. When Thomas Jefferson built his home Monticello in Virginia, the tendency in Europe during the 18th century were these large grand sweeping staircases. Thomas Jefferson thought that these staircases were a waste of floor space. They were taking up valuable floor room where you could be holding dances and parties. So when he built his home to access the second floor, he made all the staircases very steep and very narrow and hid them behind the wall behind a tiny little door. When it was found out that that's how he built his home, Americans were in love with this idea, very similar to the way we try to make our homes fashionable like those in Hollywood or the royalty in Europe still. The idea of the Jeffersonian staircase especially caught on with people who were headed west across the Appalachian Mountains who didn't have a lot of room in their home to start with and they would need all the floor space they could get so that they would have a place to work and a place to possibly even sleep. The other thing that happened in homes with stairs is now you have a closet space. This area underneath the stairs would be filled in and boxed around so that you would have a storage area. Prior to this, homes did not have closets to hang their clothes up in. Remember the early cabin, you would hang your clothes from pegs on the wall. <clears throat> in later eras, you would keep your clothes folded in trunks, or if you were lucky enough, a wardrobe. It was a separate piece of furniture that was like a closet. Remember, the stairs are steep and narrow so you have floor space, and if a, a room had a closet in it, then you were taking up valuable floor space from the room. A cabin this size could quite easily have a set of parents, um, multiple, multiple children, uh, very much more than the 2.5 of the 1950s. Uh, you would be looking at a very large family of, of maybe even up to 10 children. Uh, you could also even have extended family, grandparents, um, older relatives who could no longer live on their own might be living with you in a cabin this size as well. The one room that is definitely not part of the house yet is the bathroom. Remember you have no running water, which also means you have no way of flushing waste away from the home. What you would have to do is build a separate house outside of the home where you could take care of any necessary business that you might have. This is the outhouse. This would be built over top of a deep hole in the ground. The house itself would have a bench that went across the inside with one or more holes cut into the bench that would function as a toilet seat. The house would also be built on skis. So as that hole filled up over the years, eventually you would have to move the outhouse to a new location. You could finish filling the outhouse in with dirt and push the outhouse to a new location on its skis. Because there's no running water here, there's no way to flush excrement away this would be handled instead by keeping a small pot of lye or ash inside that could then be scooped out when you were finished and put on top of the waste products. When it was nighttime or winter, if it was too dark or too cold to make a trip outside the home to use the bathroom, you would have what's referred to as a chamber pot or sometimes called a slop bucket that would be kept inside that could be used in the night and then in the morning it could be brought out to the outhouse and emptied. For baths you would either have to bathe in a natural water source like a creek or a river or if it were getting to be the colder months 
you would have to heat the water up somehow over the fire and wash yourself off that way. Uh, you may or may not have a tub in which you could stand or sit to wash with. This is how our early settlers and even those settlers in the 19th century dealt with their bathroom issues. Some of the dangers of living in Appalachia early on certainly included things like Indian attack, but it also included a lot of natural disasters, things like flooding, water in creeks would rise, water could flow off hills, there would be mudslides, rock slides associated with that. Other issues you might have to contend with would be falling trees, especially after a storm. You'd be very thankful that it didn't hit any of the buildings on your property, your home, your barn, your outhouse. Once a tree fell, you would use the same tools that you used to build your home to cut this up. You would cut it into manageable chunks that could then be turned into firewood, tool handles, or any other sort of household good that you might could use, depending on the type of wood the tree was and what your needs were at the moment. So we see that as settlers came here between the 1750s and the 1850s, and built homes in Appalachia. The first homes were very small and modest. Some remained small and modest. Some were improved upon with time. Some were abandoned and better homes built next to them. Regardless of exactly what your cabin or home in Appalachia looked like, building it was hard work and maintaining it was hard work. The people who moved here and built these homes were hardy people who were not afraid to work hard and to start life anew here.